This morning we're going to talk about uh, doing the right things for the wrong reasons. Now, I think it's great to do the right things, but sometimes the right things are not done for very good reasons. The author Ernest Hemingway said, if you have a success, you have it for the wrong reasons. If you become popular, it's always because of the worst aspects of your work. That's maybe a little pessimistic. I read an anonymous quote uh, this week that I thought was maybe a little bit better way to put it. A positive attitude may not solve all your problems, but it will annoy enough people to make it worth the effort. I love that. I love that. Jamie and I were uh, shopping uh, yesterday, I think it was. And uh, we happened to pull up into the parking spot. Uh, there was one, and somebody pulled into the, the, the parking spot right next to us at the exact same time. And so I got out of the passenger seat and the the man who was driving got out of the driver's seat, both at the same time. And I said, gosh, what do you think the odds are that two really great looking men are gonna get out of their cars at the same time? And his face just burst into this big old grin. He goes, that's right, sticks his hand out, shakes my hand. I didn't have to say that. I'm looking for opportunities to be positive. Sometimes, hopefully most of the time for good reasons, but sometimes just to see what's going to happen. <laughs> We're going to look at something along those lines. If you will turn with me in your Bibles to John chapter 11. We're going to read from verses 45 to uh, 53. John chapter 11, 45 to 53 is on page 1670 of your pew Bible. And, and frankly, this is... Um, this is not specifically the teaching of Jesus. This is what happens when Jesus spends time around people who don't necessarily want to follow his teachings. He's a kind of a polarizing guy. And sure enough, it turns out that they end up doing what is functionally the right thing but for the wrong reasons. So let's start reading together uh, at verse 45. We'll just read 45 through 48 to start us off. John 11, 45. Therefore, many of the Jews who had come to visit Mary and had seen what Jesus did put their faith in him. But some of them went to the Pharisees and told them what Jesus had done. Then the chief priests and the Pharisees called a meeting of the Sanhedrin. What are we accomplishing, they asked. Here is this man performing many miraculous signs. If we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him, and then the Romans will come and take away both our place and our nation. So when we're making decisions, keep these things in mind. Keep the right idea in mind. And the right idea that we see here is coming together. Coming together, that's, that's a, a good thing to do. Now, in verse 45, we see that there are eyewitnesses. Many of the views who had come to, many of the Jews who had come to visit Mary had seen what Jesus did. The, 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 the original text makes kind of a big deal that these are eyewitnesses. These are not people who heard about what Jesus did. They saw it with their own eyes. And they watched Jesus' miracles, and their response to seeing Jesus work in them was they went and they talked to the chief priests. Now, if we had a pessimistic view of things, we might say, well, they went to tell on Jesus. That Jesus is doing miraculous things, and so we better tell the chief priests because they had better put a stop to this. Or, if you had a more positive spin on things, Jesus is doing miracles. Priest so-and-so, have you seen this? This is really cool. The text doesn't really indicate whether they were doing so for optimistic or pessimistic reasons. They saw, they went, and they told what they saw. The chief priests and the Pharisees, verse 47, notice it says, they called a meeting of the Sanhedrin. So 
here's the thing. I don't know if many of you remember this little in piece of information from being involved in church for a long time, but you have two power blocks that are really functioning at this time during uh, Jesus' ministry. You have the Sadducees and you have the Pharisees. And I remember learning from little songs sort of like what Mary was teaching the kids today that the Sadducees are sad, you see, <laughs> because, because they don't believe in the resurrection. And the Pharisees are fair to see because they do. So here's the thing. They come together in a meeting of the Sanhedrin. They are two opposite sides of the political and religious spectrum, and yet Jesus brings them together. So that's a good thing. And it causes them to do a little self-evaluation. Self-evaluation can be a good thing. What do they say? What are we accomplishing? Here, this man is performing many miraculous signs. And if we were to stop it right there, we could think, well, hey, that's pretty neat. They recognize that God is doing something through this person, Jesus. Hallelujah, praise God. Strike up the band, let's start singing, I'll fly away. That's not their attitude, however, because the very next verse, 48, clues us in as to what they're actually thinking and feeling about this. If we let him go on like this, like they have anything to do with it, but if we let him go on like this, everyone will come, believe in him, and then the Romans will come. Oh no, the Romans. They will come and take away both our place and our nation. Now, the end of the nation, as far as the leaders are concerned, think about it. This is Rome. This is an occupying army. Rome's modus operandi, what they did was they would move into a place that were trying to fight against them. They would win the war. They would take a whole bunch of the soldiers that they've just conquered out of the, the, the ones that were left, right? They'd take them out. They'd say, hey, now that you've shown that you... Uh, can't win against the Romans, want a job? Why don't you become a part of the Roman army? We'll teach you how to actually win wars. And then once you serve for a specific length of time, you can retire, you'll be a Roman citizen, we'll pay you a, a, a retirement thing. The only thing is you gotta pack up and go someplace else in the Roman Empire. So they would intentionally take the fighting guys out of their local area and move them to a new area and teach them how to be good Romans. And the, the area that they've just conquered, they would tax. It is not in Rome's best interest to completely wipe out a country because how are they going to collect taxes then? Somebody got to pay for all of those columns in Rome, right? So that's what Rome does. They, they don't destroy nations. They just take them over. So when the Sanhedrin is saying that Rome is going to come and take away both our place and our nation, they're not concerned about the nation as a whole. They're talking about their own power base. The Romans will come and they'll kick us, the Sanhedrin, out of office. Well, we like being in office. There's lots of perks for us being in office. Does this sound familiar to you by any chance? Government hasn't changed all that much. They are concerned. This is a response of fear. So they're doing the right thing. The people who are eyewitnesses, they come together, they report to uh, the religious leaders. The religious leaders come together because of Jesus. That's the right thing. But here is the wrong reason. Let's read from 49 to 53. Then one of them, named Caiaphas, who was priest that year, spoke up, You know nothing at all. You do not realize that it's better for you that one man die for the people than that the whole nation perish. He did not say this on his own, but as high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the Jewish nation, and not only for that nation, but also for the scattered children of God, to bring them together and make them one. So from that day on, they plotted to take his life. 
So the right thing that they did was come together. The wrong reason was fear, not trust. The Sanhedrin, these people were working out of fear, not trust. They can't see in verses 49 and 50 that Jesus' teaching and actions would eventually conquer the Roman Empire. They're too short-sighted. This is happening around, oh, say, 30 A.D. Well, in about 300 years forward from this time, Constantine, the Roman emperor, declares Christianity to be the official religion of the Roman Empire. In fact, they changed the name of it. At that point, from then on, for a thousand years, it was the Holy Roman Empire. Jesus won. The Sanhedrin just didn't want to wait that long. They are too short-sighted, and it begs the question, are we? Is God doing something among us? And maybe, I, I don't know about you, but sometimes I'm a little impatient with God. Jamie is laughing. Sometimes I'm a lot impatient with God. And I think that God should do what I think God should do on my timetable, not his. And then when he decides to do it in his way, in his time, I get frustrated. And I got to remember, I'm not building the kingdom of Ed. I'm trying to participate with God in building his kingdom. When I try to build Ed's kingdom, it's out of fear because I'm not sure how things are going to play out, and so I want to try and control what I can. It doesn't work. Look at verses 51 and 52 and 53. Caiaphas says that somebody needs to die for the people. And as we read this, notice that it goes to third person. Caiaphas isn't saying... I do not say this on my own. Now it's, it's, it's actually second person, sorry. He did not say this on his own, but as high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the Jewish nation. This is an editorial comment. This is one of those little sections of scripture that helps us realize that the Bible wasn't just dictated from on high, but that it was carefully crafted to communicate God's truth to us. This is the hand of the editor. This is John making sure we get what's actually going on. John is functioning as the, the editor looking back on what Caiaphas said. And he says, you know, he didn't come up with that on his own. God put that in him. God made sure that he said these things to help realize that Jesus is to die, not just for the Jewish people, but for all people. God has a plan. And our actions to try to cooperate with it or our frustrating actions to try to fight against it don't derail it one tiny little bit. We can't frustrate God's plan. There is never a time in all of eternity when God sits up on, the, on his throne and smacks his forehead in frustration because we did something unexpected to him. He knows what's going on. J.R.R. Tolkien, the guy who wrote The Lord of the Rings, actually wrote a, a, a significantly uh, larger collection of a bunch of short stories that give background to the events that happen in The Lord of the Rings. It's called The Cimmerillion. And th the very first story in The Cimmerillion is the depiction of how God created the universe. In that first story, God is named Iluvatar, Iluvatar Eru in, in here. And Iluvatar is a singer. In Genesis, God says, uh, the, the book says that God spoke everything into being. J.R.R. Tolkien riffs on that and said God sings everything into being. And the first thing he sings into being is a choir to join him, which I thought was pretty neat. I'm a singer. I like singing in choir. So now God has a chorus, and they're all singing together, and 
God is creating and he's, he's kind of allowing his choir to come up with harmonies and whatever, which adds shade and meaning to the universe as it's being created. And there's one jerk in the choir who decides he's just going to sing his own little solo. And it does not match what Iluvatar is directing. But Iluvatar is such a good musician. He's so in control that he takes this discord weird stuff that this one singer is doing to try and screw things up and he weaves counterpoint melodies around it and brings it all into the music and it makes the music even more poignant. There's nothing we can do to throw off God's plan for the universe. He knows way before we do how it's all going to play out and he makes it come out just right. So Jesus' sacrifice for us on the cross isn't God's plan B because, oh no, what am I going to do now? God knew, foreordained, set up before the foundations of the world how he would give himself for us. When we refuse to see that, it's because of fear. A lack of trust. Look at verse 54. Verse 53 says, So from that day on they plotted to take his life. That's the wrong reason. Verse 54. Therefore Jesus no longer moved about publicly among the Jews. Instead he withdrew to a region near the desert to a village called Ephraim where he stayed with his disciples. You see Jesus stops walking around and instead focuses his ministry. At this point in the gospel narrative we're we're nearing the end. That's why I called this series the prelude to the passion. It's it's right before Jesus starts Holy Week. Now I know that when we think about Holy Week, that's, that's usually right before Easter. There's 40 days of Lent. And, but I wanted us to see this kind of outside of that context. To realize that Jesus wasn't making it up as he went along. He knew what he was doing. And he did it on purpose. He focused his ministry, and this is his response to those who would stand against him. That was his response then, and it's still his response today. He focuses his ministry. He doesn't resist them or engage them on their terms. When Satan decided that he wanted to try and tempt Jesus at the beginning of his ministry, he got Jesus away from everybody else. He took him out into the desert and he tempted him and said, don't you want this? Don't you want that? Don't you want the other thing? And Jesus' response every time was with scripture. It is written. It is written. It is written. That obviously must have frustrated old scratch so much that finally the last temptation old scratch says well it is written and tries to throw it back in jesus face and jesus in a nicer way bible words dude you do not know what you are talking about you think it's this limited way but your attempts to derail god's plan are not going to work Because God is in control. And so we don't play the games of hell according to hell's rules. It forces us to ask the question of ourselves. How are we responding to those who would stand against Christ? Remember, As we close, think about this. Those people who might be taking an active stand against the kingdom of God, avowed enemies of God. I'm I'm an atheist. I'm I'm an agnostic. I'm a politician who says it has to be this way. I'm, you know, whatever label they use is frankly irrelevant. They 
are not the enemy. They are the foot soldiers. They're not the ones who are calling the shots against the kingdom of God. They're the shock troops that the infernal kingdom below is trying to use to undercut the kingdom of God. Functionally, they are prisoners of war who have been forced to fight on the wrong side. So our goal isn't to fight them. It's to release them. To let them know, you know, uh, you're a slave. I'm a slave too. I'm just a slave on the, on the winning side. Wouldn't you like to switch? You can. Let me introduce you to my general who paid everything for me, for you. Let's pray. Lord God, we don't ever want to lose sight of the good things you have done for us for the right reasons. Caiaphas told the truth. Verse 50, do you not realize that it's better that one man die for the people than the whole nation perish? He was saying that for the wrong reason because he was concerned about protecting his own power and his own position. But it is, in fact, the truth. It was better for us all that you took our place. We're thankful for that. We're thankful that you have chosen us to be a part of this kingdom that you have instituted and that you have fought for, and that you died for, and that you rose again and live for. So that we can follow that example. So that we can take our self-image and plant it in you. I can either listen to the enemy who says, I'm a failure, and I'm a screw-up, and I'm you know, pick every rotten thing you can think of, or I can remember the truth. I am a child of God. I am chosen. I am redeemed. I have been bought. I'm thankful. We pray, Lord, that you would continue to teach us and help us to hold on to this truth in Jesus' name. Amen.